Well, welcome to 10 Minute Record Reviews, episode 283. And this evening I'm going to talk about this record by Hank Mobley from 1964, unsurprisingly, on Blue Note, No Room for Squares. This is a Blue Note 75th anniversary pressing. Now, I've actually had some pretty good luck with the notorious 75th anniversary pressings. My luck ran out this particular copy. Avoid. Find almost any other pressing, I would say. As far as the music goes, well, I guess these days the consensus is that Hank Mobley was a previously unappreciated stalwart of the Blue Note hard bop era. Somebody once wrote he committed the cardinal sin of being listenable in an era when people like John Coltrane, Sonny Rollins even for that matter, were challenging reviewers' eardrums, or Nat Coleman particularly. Hank Mobley played really great bluesy hard bop music for a solid 10 year, 15 year period, and is probably the biggest single reason why Blue Note Records' hard bop era is so highly valued and why those records are so consistent, because he's on so very many of them. And so this record is from that great middle period of his, between 1960 and 64, before his second, more extended period of incarceration, and then subsequently the waning years of his career. It's also notable for the playing of Lee Morgan, who is absolutely stellar on here. Hank Mobley was born in Eastman, Georgia in 1930, but he's raised in Elizabeth, New Jersey, which is not far from Newark. When he was in his teens, he was housebound for a period of time with an illness, and to keep him occupied, his grandmother bought him an alto sax. Like John Coltrane, who was roughly a contemporary of his, he switched from alto to playing tenor. Clifford Brown, the trumpeter, never actually having heard Mobley play, had heard so much buzz about this young saxophonist that he recommends him to a local piano player who was leading his own combo, a guy called Paul Gayton, in 1949, and Mobley stays with Gaten for two years. In 1951, he gets, if not his big break, at least a stepping stone towards a big break, when he's hired away from Paul Gaten by a guy called Walter Davis, and Davis was a piano player too. He ran the house band at a very popular jazz club in Newark called the Piccadilly. The function of the Piccadilly was basically to be a platform for visiting stars from Manhattan who would come over the river, usually unaccompanied, and the house band would support them. And so in this role, Mobley ends up playing for all kinds of people. He backs up Miles Davis, he backs up Billie Holiday, he backs up Bud Powell, and amazingly and fantastically, there are actually extant recordings of Mobley at the Piccadilly with Walter Davis's band playing behind the trombonist Benny Green, and that is captured on not a record, but a CD called Newark 1953. As the months go by, the stars from 52nd Street keep rotating through the Piccadilly, and one day, Max Roach comes into play, and he is righteously impressed Mobley sticks with Roach for a while, and he ends up recording with him on one of Roach's first ever dates as a leader. It's actually an EP called Orientation. He's enormously inspired by the environment that he's found himself in. He's starting to compose music ferociously, and he also falls in with a number of other like-minded players, all of whom had growing reputations in the jazz scene. These other musicians included the piano player Horace Silver, the trumpeter Kenny Dorham, the bass player Doug Watkins, and the drummer Art Blakey. And these five guys agreed that they could function as a collective, and they would split all the proceeds five ways. And of course, this is the birth of the Jazz Messengers. And their emergence really does light the touch paper for the great decade of hard bop. But unfortunately, very early on, there was already trouble in paradise in the form of heroin use. Silver, in particular, got very tired very quickly of Blakey's heroin use, of Mobley's heroin use, and so he leaves the Jazz Messengers pretty quickly. Mobley, for his part, also left pretty soon because the Jazz Messengers became quite rapidly or Blakey's group, but he was already on Alfred Lyon's radar at Blue Note Records, and Lyon signs him up for what ended up being, well, certainly between 1955 and 1958, an enormously prolific period of time for Mobley recording. He makes nine records in that short span for Blue Note. He also makes three or four other records for Savoy and Prestige as well. But even though he was really in the front rank of jazz artists at this point, he was getting slowly eaten by his addictions gets busted in 1958, and he goes away for a considerable period of time, not really getting back out, I think, until late 1959. And in the five or so years before he does another stretch in 1964, although he's got some troubles in that period of time, these arguably are really his greatest years. He records in 1960 probably his two best records for Blue Note, Soul Station, and Roll Call. He also at this time gets recruited into Miles Davis's band because John Coltrane, after the somewhat apocalyptic tour of Europe that Davis and Coltrane had done, had parted ways with Miles. But it didn't go that well, partly because 
Coltrane's shoes were pretty big to fill. And because Miles was pretty cruel too, he would rag people about their playing and compare them to people who had been in the band or people that he wanted to have in the band. And he would say stuff like, it was one occasion, Mobley was actually playing a solo on stage and Davis is standing there and he says to his other bandmates, anytime Sonny Rollins shows up with his horn, he's got the job. A little bit dispiriting. Anyway, Mobley didn't stick with Miles too long. It was not a good environment. And he leaves very frustrated, gets much more heavily into drugs because he was spiraling downhill quite a lot. But he did take some things from Miles too. As much as Miles had a negative influence on his self-esteem, he also encouraged him to be a much more intentional and selective chooser of notes the way that Miles is. And you can, I think, anyway, to my uncultured ear, hear this difference in his early 60s recording from his late 50s recordings. He makes a great record in 1962 called Workout. There was another record made at the same time, which has gotten released much more recently called Another Workout, which is also fantastic. And in fact, Mobley had a recurring thing that was going on with Blue Note where not all the time, but often, I think something like nine LPs that he made were held back for at least 10 years by the label. Anyway, Blue Note does, of course, release lots of great music of his at the time as well, including this record in 1964, No Room for Squares. When he does get incarcerated again, he spends a lot of his time writing. He comes out and he's got all kinds of material and he records something like a record a year between 1965 and 1971-72. Musically, he didn't really move with the times, but his bigger problems were health problems. He had real trouble with his lungs. He hadn't taken very good care of his publishing, so he wasn't getting regularly paid. And reputedly, he dies in 1986 while sleeping rough of pneumonia, one of the great and seminal figures of 20th century jazz. This record is made in two separate sessions, basically by two different quintets. The only players who are consistent across both sessions are, of course, Mobley and Philly Joe Jones on drums. The first session occurs on March 7, 1963, and it has Donald Byrd on trumpet, Herbie Hancock on piano, and Butch Warren on bass. The other four tracks are made seven months later, again with a quintet, but this time with Lee Morgan on trumpet, Andrew Hill on piano, and John Orr on bass. As you might expect, the change in personnel offers a little bit of a different sound between the two different quintets. Interestingly, as much for Mobley sounding different, playing with, in particular with Herbie Hancock relative to Andrew Hill, as for the other players, and it may be that Hancock was maybe challenging or maybe even unsettling Mobley a little bit because Mobley's playing sounds a little bit more, ragged is the wrong word, but it's rougher on the Hancock and Bird tracks than it is when he plays with Morgan and Hill. Side One starts a three-way split, which is a fantastic track. Lee Morgan here is phenomenal. He's got Maradona-like control of his trumpet. The next track is Carolyn, which is actually written by Morgan. This is a bluesy ballad. And here on this track, I find that Andrew Hill is the guy that really grabs my attention with a very kind of less is more Ahmad Jamal kind of solo. The last track on side one is Up a Step, which is one of the two tracks with Donald Byrd and Herbie Hancock. I think this is the best track on the record. And it's interesting at this point, I mean, Mobley is such a fixture at Blue Note. He doesn't really need to prove anything. And he's so generous with space and time for his sidemen on this record that you actually kind of find what he's cited. You find yourself forgetting who's a leader. But Mobley reminds everybody who the leader is with his playing on this track. If One Step Up has competition for the best track in the record, then it's potentially the title track, which starts off side two. Next, we have Me and You, which is by Lee Morgan. This is very reminiscent, although it's two and a half months younger than the Sidewinder, which of course Morgan would soon record. Finally, Old World New Imports, the second of the two tracks with Donald Byrd and Herbie Hancock and Butch Warren. This has an incredible solo from Byrd, these remarkable runs of, I guess, their 16th notes. Mobley is pure class, and Philly Joe has some great moments here as well. If it isn't the greatest ever Hank Mobley Blue Note, and I don't think it is, it's still really emblematic of the incredible quality, effortless quality, which Mobley offered every time he stepped into the studio with Alfred Lyon. I would say, though, it's probably in the top handful of his Blue Note dates, and it's also worth getting for Lee Morgan's playing alone. For me, it's four and a half out of five stars. <laughs> 